Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the justice delivery and in this lecture we shall have a look at administrative law in tribunals. So what is administrative law? As before it is difficult to define these terms and so we can only look at what different people, different thinkers, philosophers and jurists have said about administrative law. So none of these is the complete definition but it just gives us different viewpoints about the administrative law. Austin says that administrative law is the law which determines the ends and modes to which sovereign power shall be exercised. Sovereign power is the power of the government or in those days the power of the king. So what are the ends to which the sovereign power shall be exercised? What are the objectives? And what are the modes? That is, what are the means? We have to look at both the ends as well as the means to achieve those ends. And so, here what Austin is saying is that administrative law is that law which determines both of these, the ends and the modes to which the sovereign power shall be exercised. So, it is saying that when we uh, talk about the sovereign power, we are talking about the executive power. So, what are the end goals of executing the executive power and through what means will that power be exercised? Bernard Short says administrative law is the law applicable to those administrative agencies which possess delegated legislation and adjudicatory authority. So, he is saying that it is applicable to those administrative agencies. When we talk about administrative agencies, we are talking about the executive branch of the government. And these executive agencies are possessing things like delegated legislation. So they are having some power of legislation. We talked before that the government comprises of three different organs. We have the legislature that makes the laws. We have the executive that implements the laws or executes those laws and we have the judiciary that adjudicates on the laws that resolves the disputes. But in this case what we are saying is that there are certain administrative agencies, so certain executive organ of the government that is having delegated legislation, so it has a power to legislate on something and this power has been delegated. By the word delegated we mean that the legislature itself has given this power to the executive. So, it is not that the executive is taking away the powers of the legislature. No, the legislature is saying that okay, you do this part of the legislation. So, it is a delegated power and also it possesses adjudicatory authority. Now, adjudication is the role of the judiciary, but in this case, he is saying that certain administrative agencies also have the power of adjudication. So, they are not just the executive, but they are also having some amount of legislative power and some amount of judiciary power. And if we have such executive organs or such administrative agencies, how do we govern them? So, administrative law is that law that is applicable to those administrative agencies which possess delegated legislation and adjudicatory authority. So, it is the law that governs those agencies. Then Jennings says administrative law is the law relating to administration. It determines the organization, powers and duties of administrative authorities. So, Jennings is saying that it is a law relating to administration and it determines the organization of administrative authority. So, he is not saying that it, it will only be applicable to these agencies, 
but if you talk about any administrative authority it will determine the organization of it the powers of the administrative authority and the duties of the administrative authorities so these are all different modes of thinking about the administrative law now the important things to note here is that the administrative law is applicable to all of administration but it also has very specific roles when we talk about things like delegated legislation and adjudication now the question is why do we need administrative law the first thing is the increased scope of administration in a welfare state now in a welfare state the government is trying to do welfare for its citizens so the government is not just governing it is providing facilities to the people it is providing health care it is providing roads it is providing electricity it is providing water and so on so as and when the states turn into welfare states the role of the executive increases and when you have the current status where you have welfare state where governments are doing a lot of things for their citizens there is a large scope of administration and to govern this administration you need administrative law so administrative law is the law of administration and you need more administration because we have shifted to being a welfare state we are providing the citizens with a large number of facilities and to govern these actions we need administrative law the second need is that there is an inadequacy of legislature to deal with contemporary issues which is leading to a need for delegated legislation what this is saying is that when you talk about the legislatures whether it be the parliament or the state legislatures these legislatures are not sitting every day and in a large number of cases the issues come on a day to day basis now because the issues will arise in the field situations where the executive authorities are setting so it makes a lot of sense to delegate some power to them so that the small issues can be sorted out at their own end because the legislature cannot do everything it has a paucity of resources it's not sitting every day similarly if there are certain topics that are of a specialized nature so in those cases the legislature might not be having sufficient knowledge or experience or expertise to legislate on those topics so in those cases the legislature might say that okay executive you are taking care of these things on a day to day basis why don't you do this legislation part yourself so i am giving you these powers the legislature is giving these powers to the executive in the form of a delegation so this is a delegated legislation which is occurring because of inadequacy of legislature to deal with contemporary issues that is the issues of the day and then there is also the inadequacy of the judiciary due to a large pendency of cases now because all our courts are having such a huge backlog of cases so if there is some dispute a small dispute then it is possible that it will take a very long period of time if the case is filed in a court now people on a daily basis they interact with the executive uh, authorities but they do not interact with the judicial authorities on a day to day basis now because the judiciary is overworked so the judiciary can also give some of its powers to the executive branches or the legislature may give some judicial powers to the executive now remember that our constitution says that there has to be a separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary but it does not say a strict separation of powers so there can be some overlap and it is this overlap especially in very specialized matters that we have a need for tribunals because of inadequacy of judiciary due to large pendency of cases or because of very specialized nature of cases so this is the need for administrative law 
So what is delegated legislation? It is entrusting the functions of the legislature to non-legislative organs of the government. Now this legislation may be delegated to the executive or to the judiciary. So in both the cases it will be called a, a delegated legislation. But what is the crux is that it is entrusting the functions of the legislature that is the power or the responsibility to make laws and rules to the non-legislative organs of the government that is the executive and the judiciary. Now a case in point here is the All India Services Act 1951. Now today in our country the All India Services comprise of three services the IAS, the IPS and the IFS, the Indian Administrative Service, the Indian Police Service and the Indian Forest Service. Now to govern these services this act was promulgated the All India Services Act 1951. So we are now going to look at this act in more detail and we are going to see how the legislation was delegated to the executive in this act. So let us first begin with what does the constitution say about the All India Services. So article 312 of the constitution deals with the All India Services. It says notwithstanding anything in chapter 6 of part 6 or part 11 if the council of states has decided by resolution supported by not less than two thirds of the members present in voting that it is necessary or expedient in the national interest to do so, parliament may by law provide for the creation of one or more all India services. How does it start? It starts with the council of states that is the Rajya Sabha. So if the Rajya Sabha declares by a resolution and this resolution must be supported by no less than two thirds of the members present in voting. That is it should have a support of more than two thirds of the members, two thirds or more members that it is necessary or expedient in the national interest to do so. Then parliament may by law provide for the creation of one or, one or more all India services including an Indian judicial service common to the union and the states. Now when we talk about the all India services they are common to the union and the states. So when we talk about the services there are certain central services such as the Indian revenue service or the Indian railway service or the Indian post and telegraph service. Now the officers of these services are only there with the central government. So these are the central services. But then we have certain all India services where the officers serve both the state governments as well as the central governments. So it is a common service between the states and the center. So it is saying that one or more all India services including an all India judicial service can be created which is common to the union and the state and subject to the other provisions of this chapter regulate the recruitment and the conditions of service of persons appointed to any such service. Now who can create? The parliament can create and who can regulate the recruitment and conditions of service? The parliament can do that. So all of these powers are there with the parliament. So what did the parliament do? The parliament enacted the All India Services Act 1951. If we look at the preamble it says an act to regulate the recruitment and the conditions of service of persons appointed to the All India Services common to the Union and the States. So basically it is taking the same words recruitment and the conditions of service right. So it is taking the same words and it is saying that this is an act to regulate the recruitment and the conditions of service of persons appointed to the All India Services. So be it enacted by parliament as follows, section 1 is short title, this act may be called the All India Services Act 1951. So this is the name of the act. Definition in this act the expression All India Service means the service known as the Indian Administrative Service or the service known as the Indian Police Service or any other service specified in section 2A. 
So, what are the other All India Services? With effect from such date as the central government may by notification in the official gazette appoint in this behalf, there shall be constituted the following All India Services and different dates may be appointed for different services. The first one is the Indian Service of Engineers, then the Indian Forest Service and the Indian Medical and Health Service. But the thing is, with effect from such date as the central government may by notification appoint in this behalf there shall be constituted. So, for the constitution of these services, you require a notification in the official gazette on this behalf by the central government. And the following All India Services and different dates may be appointed for different services. So, what has happened is that the central government came out with a notification for a service but not for the other two services. So basically, as of today, we have only three services, the Indian Administrative Service, the Indian Police Service and the Indian Forest Service. So these are the only three All India Services. Then it says, Regulation of Recruitment and Conditions of Service. So this is an act to regulate the recruitment and the conditions of service. And what does Section 3 say? The central government may, after consultation with the governments of the states concerned, including the state of Jammu and Kashmir, and by notification in the official gazette, make rules for the regulation of recruitment and the conditions of service of persons appointed to an All India service. Here you can see the delegation. Now the parliament has the power to make these rules and regulation, but what the parliament has done is. The parliament has said that the central government may make rules for the regulation of recruitment and conditions of service. So it has given this power. The constitution gave this power to the parliament and the parliament gave this power to the central government to make rules for the regulation of recruitment and the conditions of service of persons appointed to an all India service. Then it says the power to make rules conferred by this section shall include the power to give retrospective effect from a date not earlier than the date of commencement of this act to the rules or any of them, but no retrospective effect shall be given to any rule so as to prejudicially affect the interests of any person to whom such rule may be applicable. So these are very wide powers. You also have the power of giving retrospective effect. Then every rule made by the central government under this section and every regulation made under or in pursuance of such rule shall be laid as soon as may be after such rule or regulation is made before each house of parliament while it is in session for a total period of 30 days which may be comprised in one session or in two or more successive sessions and if before the expiry of the session immediately following the session or the successive sessions aforesaid both houses agree in making any modification in such rule or regulation or both houses agree that such rule or regulation should not be made, the rule or regulation shall thereafter have effect only in such modified form or be of no effect as the case may be. So however, that any such modification or annulment shall be without prejudice to the validity of anything previously done under that rule or regulation. Now what does this mean? It says that the central government has the power to make the rules and once the central government has made the rules, these rules shall be laid in both the houses of the parliament. So basically the parliament is saying to the government, okay you make the rules, but whatever you have made you bring that rules to us. We are going to look at it. If we think that some modification is required, we will pass uh, a resolution to that effect. If we want to say that these rules are not required, they should not be uh, uh, be there. So in that case, we shall pass a, reg a resolution to that effect. So basically what the parliament has done is to give all the powers to the government with the proviso that, that whatever you do, you bring to our notice and if we want to change anything, we will do that. So this is delegated le legislation. Then it says, Section 4, continuance of existing rules, all rules in force immediately before the commencement of this act and applicable to an all India service 
shall continue to be in force and shall be deemed to be rules made under this act and that is the end of it so basically if you think about the recruitment and the regulation of all the service conditions of the indian administrative service the indian police service and the indian forest service they are all governed by this small act of comprising of only four sections now how does that work because this act is not giving any clues it's not saying that the, that people will be recruited like this people will have service service conditions like this it's not saying anything it's just a one page act because the power to make rules has been delegated so in other words it has been outsourced to the central government so what did the central government do so the central government enacted a large number of rules so this is the website of the department of personnel and training and it talks about the revised all india services rules so the first two are the common things we have talked about the provisions of the constitution and the all india services act after that we have the all india services leave rules 1955 so we talked about the the service conditions now service conditions include things like leave so all the leaves of all these three services are governed by these rules made by the central government all india services special disability leave regulations 1957 all india services study leave regulations so even things like study leaves are governed by these and all of these are made under powers from the all india services act all india services medical attendance rules that is if you are anywhere then you have the authority to get the services of a registered medical practitioner and the uh, the entry cases of that are all governed by these rules the all india services provident fund rules governing the provident funds all india services compensatory allowance rules all india services travelling allowance rules all india services conduct rules how are you going to conduct yourself all india services prevention of sexual harassment regulations 1998 all india services discipline and appeal rules so if an all india service officer has done some misconduct then all the processes relating to disciplining that person and the rules of appeal are governed by this then you have all india services death come retirement benefits rules all india services commutation of pension regulations all india services conditions of service residuary matters rules so all of these things have been made by the central government so this is what is known as a delegated legislation now after this let us look at tribunals so we saw that administrative law is primarily related to the delegated legislation and the tribunals besides governing other matters of administration so what is a tribunal a tribunal is a body established to settle certain types of dispute so it is an established body and it is made to settle certain types of disputes so unlike a court that can settle the majority of disputes or roughly all different kinds of disputes within its jurisdiction this is an authority or a body that is established to settle certain types of dispute so there is a subject matter jurisdiction here now we saw before that jurisdiction is divided into three parts we have the territorial jurisdiction or the extent the geographical extent to which the powers of the courts lie we have pecuniary jurisdiction which is the amount that is related to the case the money value of the case and then we have the subject matter jurisdiction now in this case tribunals have the power to settle certain types of dispute so tribunals are made as per the subject matters another definition is that they are adjudicatory bodies other than courts so they are in the business of adjudicating things that is giving judgments but they are not courts but they have administrative or judicial functions 
सो बेसिकली ट्रिब्यूनल्स डिस्चार्ज जुडिशियल और क्वाजी जुडिशियल ड्यूटीज सो दीज आर द काइंड ऑफ ड्यूटीज जुडिशियल और क्वाजी जुडिशियल क्वाजी जुडिशियल मीन्स दैट इट इज नॉट फुली जुडिशियल इट कम्स समथिंग इन बिटवीन इट इज पार्टली जुडिशियल ड्यूटीज एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ ट्रिब्यूनल्स इंक्लूड थिंग्स लाइक द इंडस्ट्रियल ट्रिब्यूनल दैट इज क्रिएटेड अंडर द इंडस्ट्रियल डिस्प्यूट एक्ट नाइनटीन फोर्टी सेवन सो दिस ट्रिब्यूनल विल हैव अ सब्जेक्ट मैटर ऑफ इंडस्ट्रियल डिस्प्यूट इट वोट लुक एट एनीथिंग एल्स बट ओनली एट इंडस्ट्रियल डिस्प्यूट द इनकम टैक्स एपिलेट ट्रिब्यूनल अंडर द इनकम टैक्स एक्ट सो इट विल ओनली लुक एट इनकम टैक्स केसेस एंड दैट टू अपील केसेस सो देर इज अ सब्जेक्ट मैटर जुरिस्ट्रिक्शन द कस्टम्स एक्साइज एंड सर्विस टैक्स एपिलेट ट्रिब्यूनल अंडर द कस्टम्स एक्ट द सेंट्रल एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ट्रिब्यूनल अंडर अंडर द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव ट्रिब्यूनल एक्ट सो इट्स ओनली गोइंग टू लुक एट एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव मैटर्स द सिक्योरिटीज एपिलेट ट्रिब्यूनल अंडर द सिक्योरिटीज एक्सचेंज बोर्ड ऑफ इंडिया एक्ट दैट इज द सी बी एक्ट सो द सी बी एक्ट हैज क्रिएटेड दिस बॉडी विच विल डील विद अपील केसेज ऑफ सिक्योरिटीज द टी डी सैट द टेलीकॉम डिस्प्यूट सेटलमेंट एंड एपिलेट ट्रिब्यूनल अंडर द ट्राई एक्ट ट्राई इज टेलीकॉम रेगुलेटरी अथॉरिटी ऑफ इंडिया सो इट इज क्रिएटेड अंडर दिस एक्ट द एपिलेट ट्रिब्यूनल फॉर इलेक्ट्रिसिटी अंडर द इलेक्ट्रिसिटी एक्ट एंड द नेशनल ग्रीन ट्रिब्यूनल अंडर द नेशनल ग्रीन ट्रिब्यूनल एक्ट सो वी कैन सी इन द नेम्स दम सेल्स दैट ऑल ऑफ दीज ट्रिब्यूनल्स आर हैविंग सर्टन सब्जेक्ट मैटर जुरिस्ट्रिक्शन they are all created for certain specialized matters now one thing is very clear that these specialized matters require a, a very specialized understanding of these matters so for example we saw before that if there is a case under the ipc then the courts will automatically take jurisdiction of it because they are general laws everybody knows about them but if there is a matter under the indian forest act then we will have to tell the court because the courts do not have specialized knowledge about these matters so this is why the tribunals have been set up on all of these specialized matters so what is the difference between tribunals and courts tribunals follow a more relaxed procedure unlike courts so courts have a very strict procedure but tribunals do not have to follow those strict procedures they can create their own procedures which in most cases is much more relaxed tribunals encourage people to stand up and speak for themselves lawyers have little roles in tribunal proceedings so for instance in the case of the uh, central administrative tribunal any member of the all india service or the central service if he or she has some grudge relate, relating to service matters he or she can approach the central administrative tribunal and you just have to go there and present your case there is no need to hire a lawyer so it makes things very simple it makes things very fast then tribunals specialize in a particular subject whereas courts are more general in nature so we saw that the courts are only divided into criminal jurisdiction and civil jurisdiction but there is no further division but tribunals are specialized in a very particular subject tribunals are less expensive than courts with less or no fees and no need for advocates tribunals are often quicker for there is less pendency and the availability of expert or specialized judges now in the case of all of these acts they are special acts now in the case of special acts you have to tell to the judge what are the provisions of these acts you have to tell them you have to make them understand make them realize the importance of different sections but because the tribunals are very specialized they already have those expert members so you don't have to tell the rules and regulations in very great detail because they already know that so that makes for a very quick judgment because they already know they you already have the availability of expert or specialized judges but then tribunals often have less power there is often no power of imprisonment so these are the differences now the principles of natural justice 
apply to both the administrative law and the tribunals. So basically, when we say the principles of national justice, those two principles, nemo judex in causa sua or re sua, that is, you should not be a judge in your own case, and audi alterum partum, that is, you have to hear the other party out. So these are applicable in administrative law as well as in tribunals. So the principles of national justice apply. So let us now look at a case study, which is the National Green Tribunal Act of 2010. So this is the act, the National Green Tribunal Act of 2010. Now this act again is divided into several chapters and each chapter is divided into different sections. So let us now look at this act in more detail. So this is act 19 of 2010, so it was enacted in 2010. The preamble says an act to provide for the establishment of a national green tribunal. So why is this act enacted? It is to provide for the establishment of a national green tribunal or the NGT. Why do we need an NGT? For the effective and expeditious. It has to be effective but at the same time it has to be expeditious means fast, quick. So for the effective and quick disposal of cases relating to environmental protection and conservation of forests and other natural resources, including enforcement of any legal right relating to environment and giving relief and compensation for damages to persons and property and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. So this is an act to establish the NGT. Why do we need the NGT? For effective and quick disposal of cases. Which cases? The cases that are related to environment protection and conservation of forests and other natural resources, including other things such as enforcement of legal rights relating to environment, giving relief and compensation for damages to persons and property. So basically, if somebody has created a lot of pollution because of which there has been a damage to the personal rights and the proprietary rights, so NGT can also give relief and compensation for that and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. And whereas India is a party to the decisions taken at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held at Stockholm in June 1972. So now the preamble is saying that we need to do this because of these reasons. Because India is already a party to the decisions that were taken in Stockholm in June 1972 under the aegis of the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in which India participated and this conference called upon the states to take appropriate steps for the protection and improvement of the human environment. So the preamble is saying that we are creating this NGT because we have accepted this, because we have agreed to this, agreed to take appropriate steps, so this is an appropriate step for the protection and improvement of the human environment. And whereas decisions were taken at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development held at Rio de Janeiro in June 1992. So not just we were a party in Stockholm, we were also a party in Rio. So this is the Rio summit of June 1992, officially known as the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development and in which India participated and this conference called upon the states to provide effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings. So we are creating NGT because we were a party to this and this called upon the states to provide effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings including redress and remedy and to develop national laws regarding liability and compensation for the victims of pollution and other environmental damage. So we are creating NGT because we have agreed to this and we have agreed to this. And whereas in the judicial pronouncement in India, the right to healthy environment has been construed as a part of the right to life under article 21 of the constitution. So we are also creating NGT because it is highlighted in the constitution of India. 
because in the judicial pronouncements judicial decisions the right to healthy environment has been construed as a part of the right to life so the constitution article 21 gives the fundamental right to life and the courts have pronounced that the right to healthy environment is a part of the right to life if you do not have a healthy environment you don't have the right to life so we are creating an entity also because it's our constitutional duty and whereas it is considered expedient to implement the decisions taken at the aforesaid conferences and to have a national green tribunal in view of the involvement of multidisciplinary issues relating to the environment so we are also creating ngt because it is now considered expedient we have to quickly implement the decisions taken at the aforesaid conferences so we can no longer wait and so we need to have a national green tribunal also because it is a multidisciplinary issue most of the issues relating to the environment involve multidisciplinary issues so we need a specialized body for that so for all of these reasons be it enacted by the parliament in the 61st year of the republic of india as follows so we saw before that the preamble is an intrinsic aid to interpret the statute now in this case the preamble of the ngt act is telling us these objectives so if there is any confusion we can always go back to the preamble and see which meaning of a particular statute meets best the objectives given in the preamble so now we start with chapter 1 so section 1 says short title and commencement so we have seen that in a large number of acts the first section will always be short title and commencement so this act may be called the national green tribunal act 2010 and it shall come into force on such date as the government may by notification in the official gazette appoint so this is the name or the short title of the act and this is the commencement date now it shall come into force on such date so what is that date it is there it's written here 18th of october 2010 wide notification number so and so dated 18th of october 2010 so on this date the government notified that this act will come into force then section 2 deals with definitions in this act unless the context otherwise requires accident means an accident involving a fortuitous or sudden or unintended occurrence while handling any hazardous substance or equipment or plant or vehicle resulting in continuous or intermittent or repeated exposure to death of or injury to any person or damage to any property or environment but does not include an accident by reason only of war or civil disobedience so what it says that is that if there is a a continuous or intermittent or repeated exposure to death injury to any person or damage to property or environment because of a sudden occurrence involving any hazardous substance or equipment or plant or vehicle but this sudden occurrence is not only because of war or civil disturbance then we'll call it an accident chairperson means the chairperson of the ngt environment includes water now when it says includes water it means it can also include other things but when it says chairperson means it means that there is no other words that can be added here so this definition excludes everything else but this definition includes these words but can also include something else so environment includes water air and land and the interrelationship which exists among and between water air and land and human beings other living creatures plants microorganism and property expert member means a member of the tribunal who is appointed as such and holds qualifications specified in subsection 2 of section 5 and is not a judicial member so this definition differentiates between a judicial member and an expert member and to be an expert member the person needs to hold 
certain qualifications that are specified in subsection 2 of section 5 only then that member will be called an expert member handling in relation to any hazardous substance means the manufacture processing treatment package storage transportation use collection destruction conversion offering for sale transfer or the likes of such hazardous substance so all of these are included in the word handling hazardous substance means any substance or preparation which is defined as hazardous substance in the epa environment protection act and exceeding such quantity as specified or may be specified by the central government under the public liability insurance act so basically if there is something that is defined as hazardous and is exceeding such quantity as may be specified so that is a hazardous substance injury includes so it may include apart from these something else as well permanent partial or total disablement or sickness resulting out of an accident judicial member means a member of the tribunal who is qualified to be appointed as such under subsection 1 of section 5 and includes the chairperson so basically the chairperson will be a judicial member notification means a notification published in the official gazette person includes all these things then you have the definition of prescribed schedule substantial question relating to environment shall include an instance where there is a direct violation of a specific statutory environmental obligation by a person by which a community at large other than an individual or group of individuals is affected or likely to be affected or the gravity of damage is substantial or the damage to public health is broadly measurable and the environmental consequences related uh, relate to a specific activity or a point source of pollution tribunal is ngt workman has this meaning and for other words you have to refer to these acts so this is how it defines things so that there is no confusion about them then chapter 2 talks about establishment of the tribunal so the central government shall by notification establish with effect from such date which again is 18th of october 2010 as may be specified therein a tribunal known as the ngt the composition of the tribunal the tribunal consists of a full time chairperson not less than 10 but subject to maximum of 20 full time judicial members as the central government may from time to time notify so there have to be judicial members which should not be less than 10 but should be maximum of 20 and similarly not less than 10 but subject to maximum of 20 full time expert members so these both of these are equal in number the judicial members and the expert members the chairperson of the tribunal may if considered necessary invite any one or more person having specialized knowledge and experience in a particular case before the tribunal to assist the tribunal in that case and the central government may by notification specify the ordinary place or places of sitting of the tribunal and the territorial jurisdiction falling under each such place of sitting and the, the central government has notified that the main bench will be in delhi and you also have a large number of other benches of the NGT. Then the central government may in consultation with the chairperson of the tribunal make rules regulating generally the practices and procedure of the tribunal. So in this case who can make rules to uh, regulate the practices and procedure? The central government. Then we have qualifications for the appointment of chairperson, judicial member and expert member. A person shall not be qualified for appointment as the chairperson or judicial member of the tribunal unless he is or has been a judge of the Supreme Court of India or the Chief Justice of a High Court or a judge of the High Court. So basically now you can understand or appreciate the kind of importance that the government is giving to this tribunal. The judicial members can only be judges of the high court or the supreme court who either are the judges currently or they have been the judges that is they have retired or probably they have resigned 
only those people can become the judicial members then a person shall not be qualified for appointment as an expert member unless he has such and such degrees or he has administrative experience of 15 years including experience of 5 years in dealing with environmental matters in the central or a state government or in a reputed national or state level institution so there are very strict criteria a large administrative experience or uh, as well as environmental experience is required the chairperson judicial member and expert member of the tribunal shall not hold any other office during their tenure as such so all of these people are full time members of the tribunal they will not hold any other office and the chairperson and other judicial and expert members shall not for a period of 2 years from the date on which they cease to hold office except any employment in or connected with the management or administration of any person who has been a party to a proceeding before the tribunal under this act so now this particular sub section is saying that we need to ensure that these people are independent there has to be an independence of the judiciary they should not be taking any decisions based on extraneous factors now to ensure that they are forbidden to take any employment connected with the management or administration of anything that has a proceeding before the tribunal for a period of 2 years so you are barred from taking these employments then appointment of chairperson judicial member and expert member they are appointed by the central government the chairperson shall be appointed by the central government in consultation with the chief justice of india so now you can look at the high bars that are being set the judicial members and expert members of the tribunal shall be appointed on the recommendations of such selection committee and in such manner as may be prescribed then it talks about the term of office and other service conditions resignation so if the if these members want to resign they have to resign uh, they have to give notice in writing under their hand addressed to the central government then salaries allowances and other terms and conditions of service they are there but provided that neither the salary and allowances nor other terms and conditions of service of the chairperson and members shall be varied to their disadvantage after their appointment that is the government cannot say that okay you do this thing or else will reduce your salary you do this thing or will reduce your benefit that cannot happen so this again is to protect the entity from extraneous influences even the influence of the central government then it says removal and suspension of the chairman uh, the chairperson or the members then qualification terms and conditions of service to act as chairperson of tribunal or to discharge his function staff of the tribunal then financial and administrative powers so that is the organization of the entity then we have jurisdiction powers and proceedings of the tribunal the tribunal to settle disputes the tribunal shall have jurisdiction over all civil cases where a substantial question relating to environment including en enforcement of any legal right relating to environment is involved and such question arises out of the implementation of the enactment specified in schedule 1 so with respect to the acts that are mentioned in schedule 1 if there is any question of environment then the tribunal has all the powers in all the civil cases it shall hear the the disputes arising from questions referred settle these disputes pass orders thereon no application for adjudication of dispute under this section shall be entertained by the tribunal unless it is made within a period of 6 months from the date on which the cause of action for such dispute first arose so if there is an accident that releases pollutants then this case can be brought within a period of 6 months but the tribunal has also wide powers to relax this if it is satisfied that the applicant was prevented by sufficient cause from filing the application within the set period it may 
allow it to be filed within a further period not exceeding 60 days. So, it can exceed this 6 months by 2 more months. Then it may by order provide for things like relief, compensation and restitution. So, these are the various reliefs that it can provide. It is going to have appellate jurisdiction. So, any person aggrieved by an order or decision made on or after the commencement of this act by the appellate authority under section 8 of the water act 1974 or these other acts can come to the NGT. Then we have liability to pay relief or compensation in certain cases where deaths of or injury to any person other than a workman or damage to any property or environment has resulted then the person responsible shall have to pay such relief or compensation. If uh, and uh, for death, injury or damage and then there might also be an apportionment of the liability. Then in the cases of accidents, the tribunal shall apply the principle of no fault. Application or appeal to the tribunal. So, now this is telling the procedure how to give the application. So, each application under section 14 and 15 or an appeal under section 16 shall be made to the tribunal in such form contain such particulars and be accompanied by such documents and such fees as may be prescribed. So, this is now talking about the procedures. Then next we have the procedure and powers of the tribunal. It shall not be bound by the procedure laid down by the CPC. Now, this is what we were referring to earlier when we said that the tribunals do not follow the strict procedures. They follow more relaxed procedures. They are not bound by things like the CPC. At the same time, the tribunal is also not bound by the rules of evidence in the Indian Evidence Act. So, the procedures are very relaxed. The tribunal also has the power to regulate its own procedure. But even though the procedure is relaxed, the powers are huge. The tribunal shall have for the purposes of discharging its functions under this act, the same powers as are vested in a civil court under the CPC while trying of a suit. So, basically the tribunal can summon somebody, ask somebody to come, enforce the attendance of any person, examine the person on oath, require the discovery and production of documents, receive evidence on affidavit. Now, all of these are powers of a civil court as per the CPC, but the tribunal has been given all of these powers subject to the provisions of section 123 and 124 of the Indian Evidence Act requisition any public record or document or copy of such record or document from any office. So, it can ask for any public document. It can issue commissions for the examination of witnesses or documents. It can review its decision. It can dismiss an application for default or deciding it ex parte. It can set aside any order of dismissal of any application for default and so on. It can pass interim orders and so on. Now, all the proceedings before the tribunal shall be deemed to be judicial proceedings. So, this is now giving it much more seriousness within the meaning of section so and so and purposes of section so and so of the IPC and the tribunal shall, shall be deemed to be a civil court. Then the tribunal shall apply certain principles. What principles? Principles of sustainable development, precautionary principle. That is you need to take precautions. If you do not know something, do not rush into it. Take caution and the polluter pays principle. The person who has released pollution will also have to pay for it. This is decisions to be taken by majority. The appeal against any decision lies only to the Supreme Court. It does not lie to the High Court. Any person aggrieved by any award, decision or order of the tribunal may file an appeal to the Supreme Court within 90 days from the date of communication of the award, 
डिसीजन और ऑर्डर ऑफ द ट्रिब्यूनल प्रोवाइडेड दैट द सुप्रीम कोर्ट में अलाउ दिस पर्सन एन अपील आफ्टर नाइन्टी डेज एज वेल इफ इट वॉन्ट्स टू इफ इट इज सेटिस्फाइड देन कॉस्ट वेल डिस्पोजिंग ऑफ एन एप्लीकेशन और अपील द ट्रिब्यूनल हैज पावर टू मेक ऑर्डर एज टू कॉस्ट इट कैन आस्क टू डिपॉजिट अमाउंट पेबल फॉर डैमेज टू एनवायरमेंट यू हैव द पावर ऑफ एग्जीक्यूशन ऑफ अवार्ड और ऑर्डर और डिसीजन ऑफ द ट्रिब्यूनल देन इट टॉक्स अबाउट पेनाल्टीज If you do not comply with the orders of the tribunal, then you will be punished with an imprisonment up to three years, fine up to ten crores of rupees, and uh, or and uh, both, and in case of failure or contravention continues with an additional fine extending to twenty five thousand for every day. but if a company does so if a company does not uh, comply with the orders then the fine is even higher it is 25 crores and additional fine of 1 lakh rupees every day so there are huge penalties involved then we have offences by companies offences by government departments bar of jurisdiction so it says that from the date of establishment no civil court shall have jurisdiction on these matters cognizance of offences members to be public servants protection of their actions so this is the indemnity clause it protects these public servants the act to have overriding effect powers to amend schedule 1 so the central government can change schedule 1 which is the list of act power to make rules so the central government may make rules amendment of certain enactments power to remove difficulties and then repeal and savings so these acts the national environment tribunal act of 1995 national environment appellate authority act of 1997 are repealed so this is all about the national green tribunal these are the acts in the schedule 1 uh, on whose cases the ngt plays a role now here are the schedule 2 is the heads under which compensation or relief or damage may be claimed and schedule 3 is the amendment to certain enactments so basically what it has done is that if we look at say the forest conservation act so it it inserted a new section 2a which provided appeal to the ngt to this particular act now if you look at the website of the ngt if you look at the faqs here you have this question do i need to engage an advocate to approach the tribunal no engaging an advocate is not necessary the grief parties may approach the tribunal in person by submitting an application in the required format so this is what we were referring to that in cases of tribunals the procedure is simple and the costs are low you do not have to hire advocates in a large number of cases fees are also very low so this is about the administrative law so we looked at delegated we looked at administrative law its meaning we looked at cases of delegated legislation and we also looked at tribunals in delegated legislation we looked at the all india services act and in the case of tribunals we looked at the national green tribunal in great detail so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind